And all right, we're on air. So three, two, duty. <laughs> Sorry, that was me. <laughs> three, two, one. Welcome to another episode of the craft of. And three, your duties mess of me the up, man. Duties. Welcome to the craft duties. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the craft beer duties. Anyways, um, <laughs> oh, first I'm going to do the promo. Good. No, this is fine. Friday, yeah. So um, this is the show opener. So. Brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash Brewmasters Club. One word. You can search over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. I personally suggest Catalyst, uh, the Star Wars novel, A Rogue One Story. It was fantastic. Um, check it out. But again, use that promo code and check it out for free. <laughs> Welcome to the official podcast of the Brewmasters Club, craft brews and geek news. Sit back, pour yourself a pint, and let's get into it. Now here's the founder of the Brewmasters Club and your host, Donnie Gallagher. Welcome to the Brewmasters Club. This is Craft Brews and Geek News. We are here to talk about craft brews, geek news, both of those things. Today for the panel, I have here uh, Mr. Nicholas, Mr. Lausman. How are you? I'm doing well, sir. How are you? Doing very good. Thank you. And of course, we're joined by Rye Guy. Ryan, how are you? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me on. Fantastic. We are a man down. So Dane is not with us because he's actually on duty at the moment. <laughs> Say it, Laos. It's a big duty. I'm sorry. I just <laughs> got to throw that in there. It's a very big duty that Dane's on right now, and he's got to stay on it. So <laughs> we, have a, uh, we have a very good show tonight. We have an interview with a local beer um, guru, a true beer expert um, here for the Tampa Bay area, and, and he's been interviewed in Portland and Colorado and other places, too. He really knows his stuff, and we're going to get into a little bit of that. Uh, moving on, we have some other you know, beer-related articles. There's some monks that needed some saving for their, brew, their, um, their church that burnt down, thanks to beer. Um, it was able to bring their church back. We've got um, some great Star Wars news, of course, and then a couple other little geeky tidbits that we, uh, we want to talk about, some of which we talked about in the past. So it's a packed show. We're going to try and move pretty quickly here. Um, but the first story is going to be our interview with Sean Nordquist. So Sean, um, I think I mentioned it to you guys, and I mentioned it in a previous podcast. He's kind of the man about town for beer. Um, he was just a wealth of knowledge. Ryan, you heard a little bit of the interview before uh, we actually cut it up for this podcast. What did you think of Sean, just the way he talked? I've got four or five pieces here that we'll go through, but what were your initial opinions? Just very knowledgeable and very eloquent when he talked about it. So we talked about beer and the, the business behind beer and uh, everything yeah. that goes into it. So it was yeah. really interesting, and he's got a great way of presenting it, very passionate. Yeah, he knows. Um, he certainly knows his stuff. So without um, without hesitation, let's go ahead and get into his first um, cut here, and we'll uh, we'll just play a few minutes, and then we'll we'll talk about it. So I hope you guys uh, enjoy this. Um, Sean, can you just give us uh, your name and, and kind of what you're what you're doing here at the moment in Tampa? Uh, yeah. So um, again, I'm Sean Norquist. I'm, I'm founder of BeerForTheDaddy.com, as well as uh, serving on the board of directors for Tampa Bay Beer Week. Um, I've been with the uh, with Tampa Bay Beer Week since since its inception, um, and now you know and have served on the board for the past several years, and uh, I am <clears throat> the acting chair currently. Um, I've been involved with the beer scene uh, probably since 2008, um, just because I really you know I like I like good beer, and I and I always have. Um, I started writing uh, a beer blog back then, you know, without knowing a whole lot about. What was going on locally? There wasn't much going on locally back then, um, and then just through through writing, uh, one article turned into another, and then it turned into you know doing some print articles and locally, uh, which then turned into some print articles nationally. Um, and I just you know, I've, I've liked being involved um, in the scene, watching it grow, being part of it as it as it grows. And you've been doing um, that for almost you know, almost a decade now, right? Gosh, has it been that long? <laughs> yeah, I guess I have. 
So that was Sean, and that was just our first our first piece. He really is a wealth of knowledge, and he has been at it for for ten you know ten years. And he's not affiliated with JJ Taylor or Pepin or any of the distributors that are out here, or any of these specific breweries that are out here. So he provides a unique perspective. And through Tampa Bay Beer Week um, and the great work that they do as a nonprofit and the the philanthropic. Um, options that they offer you know it's just it's just really cool stuff so that like how he kind of paved his way just by starting writing about craft beer and things like that so uh that was very intriguing towards the beginning part of learning who he was and what he did in the community of beer so let's get into that let's find out exactly what sean's up to now explain what you do at hcc because that's a brand new thing and it's pretty amazing it is and, I, and I've, I mean, I've been at, at hcc now for for six years um and when I started there, <clears throat> mostly what I was doing was uh, environmental programs, um, a lot of outreach. Um, and over the past several years, it has moved into more um, of doing uh, workforce-related training. And so uh, a, lot of, a lot of the skills and the, and the courses that I coordinate um, are, are for some hard skills. So it's, it's things like hydraulics and pneumatics and you know, uh, programmable logic controllers and all the kind of stuff used in the manufacturing and trades industry. Um, but, you know, if, if you look at the business of brewing um, and breweries, it is a manufacturing industry. Uh, and there are, you know, there are people who are making stuff. They're making, yep. you know, now, now it just happens to be that, ha- happens to be that what they're making is beer. Uh, but, it's, you know, it's no different in, you know, in the fact that it's, you know, there are, there are raw materials that are needed. There are, there are um, uh, requirements that are, that, you know, that have to be followed. There's machinery involved. There's um, quality control. I mean, all the all these things that that uh, that are required you know, to, to make a business successful um, in, in the brewing industry, and so what I've been able to do is bring in some of the expertise of the instructors that we have at HCC uh, to uh, to offer those kinds of courses and training uh, to to breweries in the area. Um, and we've actually you know sat down with some of the breweries around Tampa Bay, talking about what are, you know, what are the needs of the brewing industry. Um, you know, that, that HCC can offer. So when we, after having some of those conversations, I also started talking with some people who operate at the front of the house. So the, uh, you know, the people who are the servers and the bartenders and the t- and who run the tasting rooms. And, and then also that, that also extends that out to some of the retail operations, um, you know, restaurants and bars and the like. And we were able to, uh, to bring in training for um, level one and two for the Cicerone. Um, Right. For people who don't know what Cicerone is, it's essentially the beer equivalent of a, of a sommelier in the, in the wine world. So learning how to properly serve and store and talk about and <clears throat> make suggestions about, about beer. So um, the fun part about that is that, you know, he, he does all this at HCC. Last man, you went to HCC. Would you, uh, would you like to do a, a beer making or a beer class or the Cicerone, you know, thing in general, learning from a guy like Sean that could tell you the ins, the outs, the equipment, how to turn it on, how to work it? Wouldn't that be a fun class? That sounds amazing. I mean, had I known that existed, yeah. I wouldn't have been in the, uh, the, uh, the, the back, behind the scenes, if you will, because that's where I was. I was in the beer drinking, the beer drinking – <laughs> the beer you'd have been more in the, in the in the beer making. I'd have been in the limelight. I mean, that would have uh, that would have been a great way to you know honestly, if I showed an interest in college in um, in brewing or anything of that nature, I mean that would have been a sweet way to launch any sort of you know career in that. But uh, sadly enough, when I was there, it, you know, it was all uh, psychology for me. So yeah. Mr. Yeah. Ryan, did you have any insight on that? I did. Yeah. No, I think uh, if I would have known that there was a beer class or a, a <laughs> beer crafting class in, in college, I think it would have been phenomenal. I would have definitely taken it and uh, probably would have gone there right after English class because that was my worst subject. So definitely. I thought it was extremely interesting. And I, I love the fact that these these courses are now available at community colleges and, and colleges. I think Yale and Harvard have brewing co- college um, classes. So uh, pretty amazing stuff. But Let's keep going on with this because there's a couple questions that I asked him about the Cicerone um, kind of uh, thing in general. I was like, he's not even a master Cicerone. He's actually only level one. Um, but yeah, he teaches these classes or these preparatory classes for front of the house and hospitality staff members. So I always thought, you know, and you know, get to it. But what is the toughest part about about becoming a Cicerone or about, about going through the training? So let's hear that. It, it's probably it's a spelling. Cicerone class. You know, what is what would you say that people find the most challenging piece of that? Is it? 
simply the the is it the biology aspect? Is it the 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 technique? I mean, what is it that people struggle with the most during that? I've always wondered. I would say, um, of course, you know, with the different levels of stuff, sir, level one, which is a certified beer server, probably the the most challenging part of that is remembering um, the specifics of different beer styles um, because there are so many uh, and. You know, getting them straight, and, and some of the questions can be fairly specific and a little bit tricky. Um, but at the at the, the level one, um, you know, some of the basics of, of serving properly and glassware and um, that sort of thing uh, is, is fairly straightforward, and um, not too many people miss out on that. Now, when you get into the level two, that's a much more involved, uh, and that's the certified sister run. Um, that is much more involved. It involves not only the written test, um, but you have to be able to uh, to demonstrate um, uh, proper serving techniques, and you have to be able to identify things like off flavors and off taste uh, and off uh, odors and things like that. And that becomes um, a much more in depth and detailed uh, kind of knowledge. That you know, it's not an easy test. I mean, it's right. a very difficult yeah. test, and, and something something like only thirty. 30 to 40 percent of people pass the first time they take it. Wow! Um, and, this, and, and these are people who work in the industry day in day out, and they know their <laughs> stuff, and, and it's still very difficult to pass. Um, so being able to to say yes, I'm a certified cicerone, it's a real a real badge of honor, and it's something to absolutely you know you know I would I would wear that pin. You know, I'm I am a level one. I'm not level two. That that's got uh, that's going to take more time um, than I have to, to dedicate to it, and it's something that you want to just. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll give it a try. Yeah, you right. You really have to, you got to commit to it. So that was the Cicerone discussion. And I, again, I know that, well, Steve, you said the spelling might be challenging for you. That's, I get that's that. That's the biggest uh, difficulty <laughs> I see in it. Is it two C's? Are we talking three S's? I mean, I where are S. we at? And don't even talk to me about E's because I'm on E. I know there's an O. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, would you would you want to become a Cicerone at one point if you had the uh, availability, the time, the resources? Yeah, I mean, in, in a way, that's kind of what we try to pass on to all of our listeners and viewers out there when we when we talk about the beers that we're drinking and what we want to drink. We try to, you know, uh, talk about those different flavor profiles and try to, um, you know, uh, yep. spot them. But it's it, from what he's saying to be trained in that is really extremely difficult yep. and. Um, you know, hard to do. So it'd be really interesting yeah, to take I, that class. I only, I only knew a touch of that basically because what happened when I first started um, in craft beer, one beer, I was trained by the uh, Mark Amos, uh, Matt Amos, excuse me, of uh, he was one of the head brewers at Brew Budweiser. So that was in 2003 when I was trained in that. But um, I mean, that was, it was a little bit of that, but it was not anything nearly as complex as a Cicerone training. So I, I, like Sean said, I think that's very admirable. I think it'd be really cool to do. And if you had that badge of honor, rock it. Um, but it does take that time and resources. So um, this whole interview will actually be available on the cast. We'll, we'll throw it up on the channel here in a little bit. Um, what I'm going to do in the meantime, there was two more points. Uh, of course, I asked Sean about Star Wars because he's a big Star Wars geek and he knows that's what we talk about. But I wanted to get at the meat and potatoes as to why Sean was on this, the show tonight. They're doing this fantastic event to benefit charity. And I'll let him explain it um, here, but it's, it's a beer fest on the pier. I mean, how cool is that, man? It doesn't get, it doesn't get much better. Um, so let me go ahead and play this for his description of what he's doing here. Sean, give us a quick rundown as to what's going on um, here in December for the pier and the charity and the cause and everything that you're working on here. Oh, yeah. So... Um as I said, I'm on, you know, I'm on the board for Tampa Bay Beer Week, and we have uh, an event coming up um, <clears throat> on December 16th uh, in, in uh, downtown St. Petersburg at the very entrance to the pier. So it's uh, right behind the uh, Museum of History, um, and it'll be December 16th from 6 to 10. Um, it is called the Holiday Cheer at the Pier, and we're calling it a winter break beer festival. And this, this year we're also doing... Uh, fundraising, benefiting uh, Affordable Christmas Tampa and also The Spring, which are two great uh, local charities um, to really help. Uh, you know, this, this time of year, it can be really tough on families. It can be tough on individuals, um, kids. Uh, you know, all, pretty much anybody um, can really use an extra helping hand uh, you know, during this time of year. So Tampa Bay Beer Week is putting on uh, this festival to raise 
to raise money. We're also, if you go to uh, TampaBayBeerWeek.com um, or find our Facebook page, we actually have um, uh, gift collection stations around it at different locations and, and breweries throughout the Tampa Bay area where we're doing a uh, collection for uh, to give out to people who you know who could use a little extra a little, little extra help this season. What did you guys think about that? Um, pretty neat event, right? And it's all to to benefit Affordable Christmas. Are you guys familiar with Affordable Christmas before? Because I I have experience with that, but I don't know if you guys have. I am not. So Affordable Christmas is, is this real novel um, charity because there's nothing more demeaning than being homeless or not able to provide for your family. And then Christmas comes around and sure. It's great when someone goes, Hey Jim, I know that you're on hard times. Here's a Huffy, go give that to your kid. But how nice is it when that, that, that adult, that the parent can, can say, you know what? I went to the store, I saved up money and I bought this and I, I bought it for you, you know, little Timmy or whoever it may be. Um, what affordable Christmas does, is they get gifts donated and they will actually sell them to these underprivileged folks for a fraction. Like hundred dollar bike would go for five dollars or ten bucks. Um, and that way, stuff set up on carts and tables throughout this affordable Christmas area, wherever it may be, it's cafeteria pavilion. And then the families can go in and actually take their money and, and, and buy things, which is it, you don't think it does a lot to you psychologically, but but having that um, pride to be able to actually physically go buy something for your kids to provide for your family, even though it's at a severely discounted rate, it still gives you a little bit that said, you know, I'm working for it, and it, and it it's not a handout. It's really just um, just to help out. So it's really um, it's an it's a great program, um, and I I'm huge hugely in support of that because I think that people need that man. Clothes and, and a little bit of that pride, you know, it's just it can really do a number on your psychology. So it's yeah. um it's a great cause. Yeah, yeah no, uh, I definitely agree. I, I feel that a, a lot actually. So uh, without going too yeah. deep into it, that's actually really heartfelt, and I can uh, appreciate that effort. Yeah, it's an amazing cause, and I uh, up until I, I worked for them with the uh, my my last um, agency, and. Um, mm-hmm. And they were one of our clients, and I just thought that was the coolest thing. I'm like, that's awesome. So you take hundred dollar gifts and Xbox, and somebody buys it for thirty bucks. You know, it's it's not the fact of buying, but it's the pride of actually taking your money and, and still buying something for your children. So, um, so it's a great program. So way to go, Sean. And now, like I said, I mentioned that um, I had to bug about Star Wars just because that's kind of our thing. That's um, mm-hmm. what we talk about. So I had him two. I asked him two questions here, and um, we'll go with one of these uh, first here. Let me see. You know, I, I was six years old when the original Star Wars came out. And my dad took me, oh, man, uh, and that's I've been awesome. a fan. You yeah. know, I've been a fan my entire life. So fantastic! Um, yeah, no, so are we. And, and how great that we get to experience that again. And you with your two boys. I mean, that's so great, man. That's you know, right? I know. Oh, right. you could. It, it's you know, it's perfect. You couldn't ask for a for a better situation. So, Sean went uh, with his dad, and now he's got two younger guys. Uh, you know, his sons, and he's now taking them to see Star Wars. So um, his little glimpse of love for Star Wars was shown there. But I asked him another question. I said, if you could have a beer with anybody, fictitious story, celebrity, whoever it may be, who would it be? Here's his answer. Yeah, no, I, I think I'd want to, you know, I'd want to hang out um, with sort of a, well, if just one person, because I think I'd want to bring together somewhat of a rogues gallery of, of like, um, you know, like Han Solo, uh, you know, Captain Reynolds from Firefly, um, Indiana Jones, you know, just a bunch of the, <laughs> He's know, the same guy, uh, though, that's probably, the problem. <laughs> you know, Rick, Rick Blaine from Casablanca, you yeah. know, just some, some of the great, sort of the, the well, the rogues gallery. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> of, um, of, of, uh, of movie heroes, um, I think would be a lot of fun. So that was it. Um, and that's kind of all we, all we, all we talked about. Talk about. But it was uh, it was fun to talk about it with him, regardless, just because of again his passion for beer and his knowledge and, and all that's good and great in the world of beer. So I thought that was really cool. What you guys have any any final thoughts or any anything lingering about that interview with Sean? It'd be cool to have actually. I mean, just a quick interrupt. It'd be cool to have a beer, a craft beer, with anybody from Casablanca because I'd be <laughs> like. You guys should be on a plane. Like this is ridiculous. <laughs> Why are you drinking beer, man? You gotta go. You're, you're lingering behind. This is quite literally dangerous. I mean, <laughs> just gotta throw that out there. I know how this thing ends. We'll be <laughs> like, you know, go on. <laughs> so, I was actually Good thinking that I would want to have a beer with Boondock Saints. To be honest with you, I'm just really. Yeah, absolutely. Which one, the left or the right? I'll take both. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. They call themselves Veritas. less than right, correct? Veritas. And Aquatus. Just I hope I said that yeah, right. That's, that's Latin for left and right, right? Yeah. <laughs> and bring on Rocco. Might as well. Bring some whiskey. Why not? Well, so so that will that will wrap it up, and I will um, again put that on the channel. That is Sean Nordquist, the founder of Beer for the Daddy, chairman of the board of directors for Tampa Bay Beer Week. He's the program and environmental outreach coordinator at Hillsborough Community College, in charge of the Cicero program there, and the vice president and board of directors for the Ocean Media Institute. All around great guy. So we'll stop tooting yeah. that horn, but thanks again, Sean, for being on the cast with us. We appreciate your insight. Uh, you moving on. Definitely. What do you say? Toot toot. No. I yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you, Sean. Appreciate you. I said to toot, to toot the horn. I'm sorry, I was officially tooting the horn. Is that not what we're supposed to do here? I thought that was my role. Well, I, I'm officially tooting the horn, so if we need a guy in the future, turns out we got one. So, eh, got a toot so I'm going to hit I'm going to hit some lightning bullet points for news stories here, and then I'm going to switch into um, the missing member of our panel posed the question to the panel, knowing that he would not be here. I will have this video question up on the video version of this podcast on YouTube. But for the audio piece, you can still hear um, our good buddy Dane um, there doing his uh, civil service and, and working for all of us to make sure we have our freedom and, and speak English and, and do all these great things. Uh, the first quick hit of news here, um, there's an Italian uh, monastery that, that burned down. Um, and this article was published on the 30th of November. After, And that wasn't burned, I'm sorry. It was a devastating earthquake that shattered uh, the, the, the church and the foundation in several buildings of the city and all sorts of stuff. So there was this group of monks uh, that were left without a church. Now, these were monks, and they were Italian monks, but they, they had an actual brewery that was attached to their church. And when the church crumbled and, and became rubble from the earthquake, the monks then took in the fire marshal and, and did some, some initial uh, you know, research and, and, and per, you know, just observing. But when the dust settled, all of them um, were able to jump back in the brewery and actually start brewing beer um, to make to, to make the, the the money to get the church back up and running. So it, it's just an interesting story. Again, it's a quick hit, but I thought it was really neat that that you know an earthquake shatters the church, leaves the brewery. Something's going on there, man, because the brewery paid for the church to come back. So it's it's pretty cool. I thought that was neat, Ryan. I, I want to know if you have any insight on that or, or what your thoughts were from that story. <laughs> I mean, when when things fall, they can be built back up bigger, better, brighter than ever. And sometimes beer's involved. So, um, you know, whatever trials and uh, tribulations they went through, it was good that they were able to keep a positive attitude and, and focus on not only life, but the, the craft of brewing their beer for not only rebuilding their lives, but other people as well. So kept them going, you know, it gave them something to focus on other than the, the ruins of, their monastery and all of that. So um, another yeah. heartwarming story on this podcast this evening. So yeah, man. Like we're all it. about it. We're all about heartwarming stories here, especially when they're, uh, they're relevant and they're, they're newsworthy. And I thought that was a very interesting story. Lost. Did you have any thoughts on that before we move on to Mr. Dano's uh, question for the panel? Of course I do. Uh, I mean, I think that's wonderful. So, you know, out of the ashes, of a church rises a brewery yet again. I mean, kind of like how it began, you know, most likely. I mean, there was a pretty prominent brewery, and then that's what took hold for a church and things and so on. But um, that that's actually really wonderful to hear about, that, um, that breweries can, you know, they can kind of get brought down to their knees, just like a church, but rise twice as fast. So, I mean, that's cool. Like, I like that. I mean, it, yeah, it's very it, cool. That speaks volumes for like the uh, the industry and how it could be so widespread and how it can so be it, it could just be so how impactful beer is that's how impactful beer is that's that's what I took out of that it was yeah, like absolutely. man look at that you know that's it's just an amazing story and it's an amazing um, piece of news so I thought that was very cool yeah, um, well, yeah definitely so moving on I'm gonna go ahead and put our um, our number one stunner here Mr. Dano uh, our big marine buddy. Up on the screen here. Let me see. And Hoorah, motivators. This is Dane. Coming at you from Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Sorry I couldn't make it to the panel tonight. As you can see, I'm in a van. And I'm on duty. So, that being said, I have a question for the panel. There was one beer, and one beer only that you had to drink for the rest of your life. 
what beer would that be and why? For me, probably Goose Island IPA. Why? Because it tastes good and I like it. What say you? To all the viewers and listeners out there, stay motivated, enjoy the cast, and I'll see you next time. Out. Stay motivated. See you next time. I love it. So we've got emotions. We've got um, uh, Dane trying to get everybody excited and, and motivated. You know, we see this this podcast is a is a is a, a role today, man. We're just knocking stuff knocking stuff out of the park. I feel like while he was saying that, he was rappelling out of a Blackhawk and looking directly into a GoPro. Like, I mean, that's all I can Agreed. see when I hear that. I can see with my ears. I don't know. Is that a thing? I, it might be. I was thinking parachuting, yeah, well, and there was no wind, just straight adrenaline going right into that same visual. So, Donnie, you, so you go ahead. It's a loaded question because um, we all know that I personally love our unofficial sponsor, the Sierra Nevada, um, the IPA, just the the uh, the pale ale. Excuse me. There's the Sierra Nevada pale ale is probably one of my most favorite beers in the entire world. It's consistent. It's drinkable. It's great. Um, I also love Yingling. Uh, on top of Yingling, I also love Cigar City's um, Highlight. It's probably my favorite IPA, and I love it because it, it it gives me everything I want out of an IPA. It's floral, it's citrusy, it's it's so drinkable. It's hoppy. It's uh, it, it's got a seven and a half percent alcohol, so you can have a couple and loosen up a bit. Um, it's it's just kind of one of those. I mean, I think that's it. I, honestly, as I'm talking through it, I think that's it. If I had to drink one beer. Just because I love it so much, I would probably have to stick with an IPA, which is unfortunate because if you only drank one beer for the rest of your life, it would probably you'd probably get pretty annoyed of hops. <laughs> That's just my opinion. I mean, pretty much. Who's next? No, just you. talk through it. Yeah, okay, so well, I right. can't talk so, through this. This is there's no talking. It's not like a like a birth of okay, a well, child where you can talk uh, through and coach. This is this is a tough decision. I feel like you could have <laughs> coached me through it. You could have given me some hoo hoo has, and I would have been cool with it. But that's fine. But, but you, you don't can drink anything, and I you're okay well, with it. So and I do. It's so not the same. I drink, I drink dirt water sometimes. So deal with that. But what? it's not even the thing. I mean, in all your- honesty, I you know what? I already have my decision. It would be the Victory Gold Monkey. Good choice. Uh, that is that is an extremely drinkable beer as well. I, I it is. I, it I quite literally beer. drinks yeah. like water at this point for me. It did not used to, so I do have to throw mm-hmm. that out there. I mean, that's one of those things where if you're new to this podcast, if you're new to us, if you don't know who I am, first off, that's on you. That's piss <laughs> poor, at least. <laughs> but second off, I mean. It, <laughs> It, quite literally, it's a drinkable beer. It's great for craft beer. It's it's so easy to step into that and say, "Hey, this is something that you know in a in a pinch, it'll get the job done. It'll it'll get you where you're going." I mean, if you wanted to stop where you're going, whoa, you stepped on the wrong train. This is all wrong for you. Please step off. It's already too late. But I, I'm going to go on. But I mean, in all honesty, it's a great beer. I could drink it forever. I mean, I could drink heavier beers i can drink lighter beers at the end of the day that will be my baseline so why would i drink anything else and why would i want anything else from a beer that i can only pick once so in my opinion yet again victory gold monkey done it's a delicious beer man it's not a bad choice i I do like it for all the same reasons you said mr rye guy what do you got man great choices on both your ends uh i at first was thinking what donnie chose and then second backup was what Laos chose. So I am going to go with what I shared a couple of maybe like six, seven weeks ago with the narwhal from. Oh, Sierra. you love that narwhal, man. You love it. I, it's such a gnarly drink. It really is. And you know what? For narwhal for the out that it is, <laughs> you know, the high alcohol percentage and all of that, I, I will take that for the rest of my life just because, you know, I. I can't. I can't just go with what Donnie and Lau said. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, you don't want to. Well, you know, and I, and I kind of probably took a cop out just because we we do talk about Cigar City a lot. Um, but no, it is it is truly. Beer. I would definitely consider that as my last resort. But yeah, it's it's truly one of my favorites. So, but the monkey. question wasn't what's your favorite. It was what would you what would you drink forever, and if that was it, that and one. You know, yeah, that's it. That that's what I would settle on for the rest of my life if I had to. So, triple, yep. totally. <laughs> triple, triple. Hey, nothing wrong with the triple. Uh, I was thinking oh, unholy, to be honest with you. Once you said the golden monkey, I was thinking the unholy. 
triples uh, weren't wrong the first two times, so it's right. That unholy is is another one. It's just that's just amazingly drinkable, and it's oh, it's yeah. complex it's and it's full of flavor, but it's it's really good. It's so yeah. deceptive though, because you drink two or three of those, and you're like, Whoa. they sneak. Yeah, they sneak. Where that come from? Very sneaky, sir. The g- great question, Dane. Thanks for serving our country and serving those questions. So what that what that does is that brings us into our next segment, um, which we always do is we talk about our um, local news in our app, uh, what's going on. Uh, the Brewmasters Club, as you guys all know, if you're new to the show, welcome. Uh, what we do is we are a crowdfunded organization that helps to pair craft beer and food to experience and to get you to experience um, a new level of craft beer. So... We hope to influence people to drink local, to try new things, to step out of their comfort zone. That is why we're here. That is the only reason. And we do that via our app, our events, our technology, and, of course, our podcast. So we hope that you are um, at least uh, enjoying some of these beers that we're talking about or trying some things. you have never had them before. Um, we, we, know, we strongly encourage that. Um, moving on to our first geeky news story. Boyos, I had a, uh, had a question for you. I don't know if you saw it, and I specifically didn't include it in these notes because it's, a, it's an interesting number. But the, the question that I had for you was, what would you guess Rogue One is slated to open at for the opening weekend? A little bit of backstory for you while you're thinking about that. Force Awakens opened this time last year uh, to a record $248 million domestically. Uh, amazing. Uh, they eventually grossed $2.07 billion worldwide. That is an impressive, impressive number for a movie. So we're talking nationally. What is, and it was came out of Yahoo News story. What is the prediction that you'd like to make for the gross opening weekend? Um, I have mine, but of course I know the answer. So it's, I'm not going to say it. Um, Ryan, I want to go first. Go, okay, Nick, go ahead. Throw a number I'm, out. I'm just going to throw it up real quick. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'd like to say uh, Rogue One billion for open. No, no, that's wrong. Okay, Rogue One hundred million. <laughs> okay, that's better. This is domestics box box office just for the weekend, so it's not. Just, I'm only squawking not. domestics, bro. Okay, well, all right, hundred million, Ryan. What do you think? Uh, let's go. Two hundred forty-three million six hundred eighty-seven thousand two hundred ninety-seven and thirty cents. So, so when 1, I first read seven hundred ninety, bam, 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 bam. That's nice. Right. When I was first trying to trying to think of this number, without without reading it first, I heard it on another podcast, Jedi Collider, and they were talking about it, and I actually skipped past the parts that um that would not let me. Uh, you know, spoil it. And I wanted to, I wanted to try and make, come up with an answer too, because Rogue One has this interesting opportunity where Star Wars, Force Awakens, Ryan, which I know you, you just watched, um, had this neat thing where Star Wars was pretty much dead in terms of movie turn. You know, there was no movies coming. They were off the air. They had not been there for a long time. And it had this big fanfare, which led to this insane um, box office record smashing release. Rogue One, is not that, and there's still people that are sitting on their couches in between Monday Night Football and watching these commercials and going, "Why? Why did they recast that that Ray girl? I thought she did a good job. Uh, why is Darth Vader in this? Did he come back? Is he not dead? You know, people are still very confused. So, I think Rogue One has a challenge. But you guys ready for the number? Yes. Yes. 130 million is what they're predicting, which is slightly close to half of what Force Awakens opened with, aka um, last one. Yeah, you got the closest. But, so why do you um, think that is? What What do you think the there was a song in the eighties, and that's why work. I went ahead and led with. It. Oh, I don't know why they're suggesting that, um, but I can tell you why it's about half. I mean, I honestly think that this is, in a way, kind of riding coattails of Force Awakens. As in, it is not going to make as much money as Force Awakens did, and they are not expecting to. In fact, uh, by Bob Arga, the the execs over at Disney even came out and said, "Listen, we we we're telling our stockholders now this is not going to be the Force Awakens, but." It will be our first standalone movie, and it will set us in a direction of being able to produce winners and good box office movies for these standalone films that are outside the anthology. So that's my at least uh, thoughts on that, Ryan. So this is kind of like the Star Wars movie whole filler, if you will. I mean, Absolutely. they're, they're kind yeah. of just paving the way, getting it through, maybe creating another storyline. or Well, it's already created, but filling that Think Star it- Wars void, if you will. 
Yeah, and think of it more like um, like what, what Disney's doing with Marvel. So we have, you know, we have an Avengers movie, then we have Captain America 2, then we have an Avengers movie, then we have, you know, Thor or whatever. So we're not to the level of having two, three, four Star Wars movies in a year. Right. But there's two years in between these anthology films. So what goes in there? The Han Solo movie goes in there. What goes in there? The the Rogue One goes in there or Ben Kenobi story or whatever they do next. So, so, um, so does this become like an episode four? If you will, like, if you want to put it in that timeline, of it's things, a prequel or <laughs> it's okay. Ro- Rogue One is a prequel. So it comes after three <laughs> and then it's before four. So it's got to be like the three and a half, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it technically is. I mean, it's it, this movie will end just as, the original Star Wars in 1977 opened. Uh-huh. The door goes down in this movie; it comes up in that one, and that's that's where it's going to take off. Okay. Which is going to be okay. interesting to see how they tie that in. So I think it's not going to be a 3.75 before. The no, okay. it's this. They said it's like literally 15 minutes before that movie picks up, so it'll be it'll be close. So nice. It, it'll be neat though. Lost man, any final thoughts? Oh boy, uh, it's going to be neat. Going to be neat to see how that transitions. Uh, do you do you think that there's been like a strong pull for this though, or where people have been like, well, what, what happened between the time that the what uh, you know episode three ended and episode four began? Like, yeah, don't you feel like people would just be connected to it to where they're just gonna go bonkers when it comes out? I think that's grossly underestimated the gross of this, yeah. you know. Uh, I agree. Really? Well, and that's why that's why, and I mentioned it in the uh, in the audio and uh, audible promo is that Catalyst book, man, it picks up during the battles of the third prequel of the the last one when Darth Vader becomes Darth Vader. He yeah. it, it picks up kind of right there, and it follows this family up until you know and shows the relationship up until Rogue One starts. And if you watch the trailers after reading or, or listening to this book. Um, it all makes sense, and, and you see the animosity, and you see how these guys are buddies, and now they're, they're, there's a debt owed, and, and he's coming in to repay it, and, and just a mess, man. It's just a mess, but they, they explain everything in that, in that book. It's really the, one of the best Star Wars books I've, I've ever read, so um, very good. So the next article that we have here in our, our geeking news section is a reoccurring article. The piece of news piece that of I news. wanted to say was that these drones, they put a price out for them. And we're not going to play the guessing game because um, I put it on the notes so you guys can see it. But $239 each. Are we still buying them? Are we still no. all buying them? No, yeah. <laughs> you're out, tapped okay. out. Well, so you're... The, well, the only reason I'm out is because they they didn't make them th- to be as durable as I thought that they would make. They were well, even like, don't battle with these, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean. They're flying yeah. drone toys that are supposed to be shooting at each other and fly up to 35 miles of an course. hour. So, so yeah, I would, I would assume that they're... they're but when you break. think of Star Wars and, and you think of, you know, all of that, you, you know, you don't want to just fly something that's going to just bust if you if you hit it into something. I, I don't know. I, I was I was thinking more. I was thinking they were bigger. They looked bigger on the screen. <laughs> they seemed really tiny. But uh, they'd still be fun to have for nostalgia. Oh, no, I, I totally agree. I think they're fun. Um, so those were the two pieces of Star Wars news that I wanted to jump right into. Um, did anybody bring anything special to uh, to drink? I have something that's um, different, but it's not exactly special. Um, Lost, what do you got there, man? For our, what are we bag? drinking? What are you going to drink? It uh, quite. I'll prescribe it for the listeners here. It says uh, uh, for podcast only, uh, and there are several exclamation points. One of them, actually, I'll be honest, is a skull face. But uh, so it's actually it's it's my little uh, propose here to uh, my interlude, if you will. Um, times have been tough here at the Laos House. Um, we uh, <laughs> we can only afford the one beer, so for tonight it is Bell's, uh, which again I'm well aware is not very rare, but it's the Bell's uh, best brown ale, and again it symbolizes the season. So I'm very excited about it, but um, I'm willing to try it again. I've tried this before in the past. Willing to try it again in a different season. Now we're talking Christmas. Before we were yeah. talking pre-Christmas. I mean, it goes on. And that's some money. But uh, the point here is, is that uh, I don't have enough money to afford this beer year-round. So, or beer round, if you will. Um, that's it. That's all I got. 
So, <laughs> well, you know, Bells is out of Kalamazoo, right? Chet's old stomping Bells around. Is, Bells is out of KZ, and I'm aware of that. But I'm actually kind of worried about beers out of Michigan because I feel like if you know, and this, I have no reflection on Michigan, but from what I see, if Michigan keeps taking a very severe hit economically, I can only imagine their beers to do the same. So I'm, I'm actually quite alarmed at, uh, at what might be coming out of Michigan these days. I hope Bell's keeps maintaining. I hope all the other sort of beers keep maintaining, but I just don't know. I mean, I'm, I don't live there. I don't see the struggle, but you know, I, I see less and less of what I want to see out of them. So I hope things are totally normal, but I'd be bummed if they weren't. That's all I got to say. Well, Bell's is, Bell's always makes good stuff, man. I, I love the Oberon. Um, it's it's one of my favorite wheat beers. But Ryan, what'd you bring? Anything anything interesting? Yeah, I actually uh, brought two to the table tonight that I was able to dig. All up. right. Uh, the first being from Anchor Brewery out of San Francisco, California, and this is their porter. Really small but traditional. Well, really large but traditional uh, company that makes a very delicious porter. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the deeps uh, or the depths of what it's uh, tastes like, but it's definitely very uh, dark, rich. You'll, you'll definitely pick up on some toffee and coffee flavors. Uh, there's a big distinction there. And um, it was just a very good beer. I've, I've been drinking kind of back and forth between the two that I have here and uh, totally blown away. This, this, that porter is probably one of the best that I've had hmm. in, in a good while next to that. Uh, uh, I think that Russian one I had a couple or Polish one. I had a couple weeks ago, the Zywick. Zywick. Where's Dane when you need him? Yeah. Right. <laughs> what was, your, what was <laughs> your duty actually, if you need him. So he's halfway up a wire fence. <laughs> we should call him and tell him I need him right now. Nope. Yeah, no, 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 no. Not a good idea. Nope. Okay. He's got a baby on the way. <laughs> well, <laughs> what was the uh, what was the second one you brought? Off, no. The the second one I've got here is, and this is it comes in at eight and a half percent. It is called the Skull Splitter. So um, definitely a really nifty name there. And I it's from Kualu Kualu Quil I can't say it because there's a Hawaii. It, well, it's Q U O Y, <laughs> Atlanta, <No>. Georgia. <laughs> yep, there it is. So, but uh, definitely a fantastic beer. And uh, beer advocate for all our fans out there actually has this coming in at a ninety-one, uh, but a hundred to the bros. Mm -hmm. It comes like I said, hundred uh, uh, eight and a half percent. So, very good beer. Dif different from what I've uh, normally like to taste, but it's it's. Even though it's a scotch kind of ale with a barley wine mix and mm. all those other things makes you feel real warm for the for the winter times. Uh, it doesn't taste quite – taste very beery. It's not all barley wine-ish and Scottish ale-ish. It's, it's got a good blend of flavors, so definitely check those out. And uh, pretty cool bottle too. It's got a little Viking on the front. So. <laughs> Awesome, man. Yeah, so definitely. Brought... Hopefully I described that pretty good because it's it's hard to describe two beers back to back when they're both very, very good. And when they're on their best. Yeah, well. I mean, that's on you. <laughs> I brought I brought a beer from St. Pete um, Brewing Three Daughters, uh, which I've had. Uh, I've been on Three Daughters Kick. I had, I had a whole bunch in my fridge. So the blonde is good. My wife likes the blonde. It's probably not my favorite one from Three Daughters, but um, like their IPA, their Brandy Twist is pretty good. But the blonde is drinkable, and it's it's easy to drink, and it's easy to um, to get people that may not have the same palate um, to try to drink. Um, I do have one other beer, and I just want to bring it and show it. If I was not going to be surprised, I was going to say it might be his Dooney. You what? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Check out this bad boy. Woo! Oh, now that oh, looks at very complex, dark beer. I mean, I got to know more about it. What is what it? Is, what Fifth is it? <laughs> blank. This is, this is going to be the beer that we are going to drink, and this is going to be uh, one of these bad boys, or a few of these might be cracked open as early as Saturday uh, for the little uh, crawfish celebration. But this is our Spartan Kick IPA, and you can see a little yeasty at the bottom there. Ooh, a little Super yeasty. yeasty. Yeah, there's a little bit of yeast on there, but that's okay because this beer will be okay. poured out. You know, we'll, be, we'll pour it out into a glass and we'll, we'll sample it and we'll try it with some um, some seafood, some Cajun food and, uh, 
and it's just got a it's got a nice little little look to it. Um, it's actually quite clear for what I, for what it looked like, Ryan, when we were when we were bottling it. Um, well, that's a pretty bright flashlight. Just throwing it out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, <laughs> but it's um they're looking good, man. I'm excited. I'm really excited to try these, and they've all held their carbonation. None of them exploded. So, so um that's what we're gonna drink. You what know, is the to, uh, throw name any... of that? Oh, go ahead. No, I was just Spartan Kick IPA. Boom, love it. Boom, Boom. Yeah. great name for for an IPA, and um, you know, in Dane's gonna... honor, <laughs> <laughs> who's not here, but that's okay because he's doing other things for the country. He's actually Spartan kicking people. That's what he does. <laughs> On call, uh, not to not to not to spoil anything, but it's just it's such a great. Thing to to experience and i hope that uh, for all our listeners that have been following and have heard the podcast that uh you know for the whole brewing process hopefully we do you guys proud but it, it's really like even though it's been three weeks it's like kind of bringing or welcoming home that that, that child that that <laughs> it's like caring child. for something that's uh, yeah i mean for 21 days nobody cooks for 21 days you don't you don't make dinner for 21 days and then have the feast you make it like in one day this is 21 days of preparation and it's yeah. gonna be awesome care, so. like you said yeah it will be awesome and um we will share that and the process the whole me and ryan brewing that whole experience is on this channel now um it is on youtube as well um so please just check it out um but but yeah it was a, it was a great time so we will tune in and i guarantee you'll hear from us tomorrow or absolutely. saturday excuse me. absolutely the very last piece of news that I have, guys, just to wrap things up, is Stranger Things 2. They on um, the season two, excuse me, has a release date. Well, kind of. Um, it's going to be coming very, very soon. But they they actually put in a couple different new characters now. So there's a brother sister combination. Two new new ish actors. Um, they're not really uh, very well known. Uh, one of them, Sadie Sink. Uh, she's a redhead. She came from the Unbreakable Kimmy, Kimmy Schmidt show. If you've ever seen that. And um, yeah. Darcy Mc Montgomery, I think he's the Red Ranger from the new Power Rangers movie. So um, just some handsome Australian guy, which is apparently all that comes out of Australia. Um, but uh, <laughs> should be really should be really awesome. I'm freaking super stoked for this. Um, they say that season two is going to pick up 12 months after the events of the season one finale. Um, the Duffer brothers who are directing this will explain kind of the time jump and what happens with the series returns. Um, but the, the viewers will have to piece together some of the, the, the missing time um, themselves, which is, which is in, in route in line with, with what season one kind of gave us. So, um, I think that we all caught up on stranger things, right. And just are in love with that show. It's great. Fantastic. Want some more of it? Yes. Ever dump it. All over me. Yep, I'll take <laughs> definitely. It. I yeah. uh, uh, was actually uh, so intrigued when I found out that you know this was all going down, and uh, one of the things that you just mentioned, where they're you know try to film it where it looks like it's twelve months after, is because they wanted to make sure, kind of like the Harry Potter series, where the the actors grew and they they aged. Mm. I mean, some of them changed their voices a little bit, so they're going to try to. It, it, it actually opened up an avenue of storytelling. Uh, from what I understand, as they film this second season, because they're able to explain what's been going on since you know everything happened in the original series, so it's going to build on that and create a nice backstory. But it's also going to uh, build for this season two and, and and kind of explain where this where where everything's going directionally with the new characters. And um, does anybody have any thoughts on what's going to happen to Will in this <laughs> upcoming season? Because that seems to get more slugs. Like yeah, well, that seems to be like <laughs> the most intriguing thing of what people are thinking is, you know, is he just going to be having, is he is he changing himself in the real world and, and all of that stuff? So anybody have any thoughts on that? Nope. I know they're bringing back 11. I know that's, that it was rumored, speculated that 11 will come back for, yeah. for one of the, or be featured again in one of these episodes. So that'll be interesting too. Um, no, Little Will, dude, uh, that show left, that, that last episode did it wrapped up the show so well at the same time it left you just scratching your head with this weird look on your face like what the hell was that um i'm really excited to see what happens that's all yeah. i can say <laughs> and i'm really excited for the soundtrack are they going to keep it the same or are they going to change it they'll they'll keep it they'll keep awesome. the same yeah that soundtrack is awesome 
Well, um, well, that about wraps it up, guys. Thanks for the time. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Um, what to tune in to uh, next week. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be recapping our Crawfish Ball 31 and Craft Beer Extravaganza, known as My Birthday, which is happening on Saturday. We're going to do a little casting. Um, yeah. We'll do a little partying. We'll do a little beer drinking. We're going to go check out a brand-new brewery that's right down the street. Um, it should be a really nice time, but we will definitely be, be chiming in and um, providing updates and including everybody in as, as to what's going on in terms of what beers we brought and, and how our beer turned out and how the crawfish came with it tasted with a double ipa or, or the torpedo clone so uh spartan kick ipa will certainly get its uh merits tested saturday um good that is it so uh where can the good people find us you can always find us on um at the brewmasters club on youtube facebook twitter um you can follow along with this uh this podcast here to, to of course tune into all of us you can use the hashtag at um hashtag uh, the Brewmasters Club cast that will get your tweets in front of us. It's the best way to get a hold of us. Um, Facebook, same way. Instagram, same way. Uh, Brewmasters Club cast, and we will answer questions or uh, take suggestions. Uh, whatever you really want to want to talk to us about, we're, we we love to to talk with our with our fans. So please do that, um, Mr. Raga. Where can the kids find you? You guys can find me on the Twitter machine uh, at BroodBoy813. Let us know if you have any questions, comments, or anything else. And Mr. Mr. Lousman. If you have any comments only, you can post them to uh, at Mr. Lossman, but just comments. I want, if you have a question, you can take your question, you can sit on it. If you've got a comment, just let it blow. Oh, let it blow, way. blow it out, blow all your comments out. I'm here for you. Pretty specific. All right. Well, again, guys, Super. it helps support the show by using the uh, Amazon affiliate link. It, below this description, below all the descriptions of the various links that we have this in. Also, if you um, have not tried that Amazon or that Amazon Audible uh, audiobook, it's a great way to do it. And if you use the code that we have um, from audibletrial.com forward slash brewmasters club, you can get a free book. Uh, you can start your subscription. If you don't like it in 30 days, you get to keep the book. Delete your membership, you get to keep the book. Helps the show um, and really. It's the best way to listen to Catalyst to get yourself all stoked for Rogue One. Have a great weekend, everybody. Uh, be safe. Uh, we love you, and we will talk to you next time. Cheers. Cheers, mate. You've been listening to the official podcast of the Brewmasters Club, craft brews and geek news. Grab a beer with the guys and be sure to subscribe to catch additional content. Add this podcast to your favorite RSS feed or iTunes. Chat with the guys on Twitter at Brewmasters Club and Facebook and online at www.brewmasters.club. Cheers. <laughs>